Hello everyone, and welcome to this mini lecture on Introduction to Fiction Part 1, Structure and Consequences. And I've broken up the, the, the fiction introduction into five parts, uh, because there's a lot of different things to talk about as we talk about fiction. And I should say that anything that we cover in here is really true for any of the texts that we cover, but it becomes particularly challenging or useful to keep in mind as we get into fiction. Uh, but I should also say that anything we cover in here would be things that you could use not just with reading fiction, but with any kind of storytelling, whether it's, you know, reading a book, reading a comic book, listening to a radio drama, or watching a TV show or a movie that all of these have uh, those further those further uses that it can make watching or, or engaging in any kind of storytelling that much more meaningful. So this series of lectures is inspired in part by How to Read Literature Like a Professor by Thomas Foster. It's a book I highly recommend for anyone. He also has How to Read a Novel Like a Professor. They're, bo they're both really good accessible books that give you a lot of good ways of making sense of reading. They're, they're easy to read, they're not jar jargon laden, um, they have a lot of good ideas in them. And then Away with Words, which is a, a lecture series from The Modern Scholar uh, by Michael C. Drought. And it's, it's again, it's another series. There's, there's four lecture series, or there, there's four parts, um, and there's a lot of great things in there that you can take from it that can help you with not just understanding literature, but communication and, and understanding all forms of storytelling. So let's start off. First we have, uh, as Foster points out, we have three keys of literature. And these are things that you can use when we talk about keys, things you can use to unlock meaning, things you can use to open up doors about what's going on. And so the first is memory. And you want to ask that question, where have I seen that before? So when you're we're dealing with memory, you always want to try to connect whatever you're reading with other things that you've read. And sometimes it can be the, the work as a whole, or it can be individual pieces of the work. So, you know, a, a good example is if you've ever watched the show Sons of Anarchy. Well, Sons of Anarchy in some ways is inspired by Hamlet, because you have a situation in which the uh, an uncle character is going after the main character's mother, and there's some implication about how the the father of the main character dies, and so you can use that. You can help to frame and make sense of Sons of Anarchy by understanding Hamlet. Symbol. What can or does that stand for? And so here again, you want to use your memory and kind of think about what symbols you've seen elsewhere. Uh, you want to think about what are the traditional symbols. Every culture has, you know, a collection of symbols that everybody knows, and then other symbols that you pick up here and there, right? The peace symbol, the, the peace sign is a symbol. The flag is a symbol. If somebody has a flag, they're symbolizing something larger. The flag isn't just a decoration, it means something more. So you're constantly looking for symbols. Doves are symbols. The heart sign, right? That little the heart, the heart is a symbol, right? Because it never actually looks like the heart, the thing that's in us. It looks like this, you know, strangely shaped, um, you know, it almost looks like two, uh, two half ovals, it, you know, forged together in some way. So, be on the lookout and be thinking about, you know, what have I seen before? And then pattern. So pattern is similar to memory, because you're still asking where have I seen that before, but you're thinking about repetition, you're thinking about how things, you know, show up again. And if something has shown up before, and does have some kind of meaning, right, so it has memory, and it has symbolism, then you might be looking at a pattern. So pattern is a little, it, it takes memory to a degree of repetition. Um, and you want to be, you want to look at these three things and know that this is in many ways how fiction functions. So one thing to understand, and, and I like how Foster puts this, he says all stories are one story. And what is that story? That story is the human condition. All of fiction, I, so, uh, you know, poetry, much of, much of writing all around is about trying to understand and transcend our human isolation. Now what do I mean by human isolation? I mean that as an individual you live in your 
mind. That's your entire life, is understanding the world through your mind. How do you bridge the gap from your mind to somebody else's mind? Right? How do you better understand what it's like to be human besides your central experience? Well, literature helps us do that. Stories help us do that. Right? It helps us bridge that connection. It helps us understand what it's like for other humans out there. It's not perfect by any means, but it is a way of doing that. Now, typically, when we're dealing with stories, Foster likes to say that you know th there's there's five steps, or there's a quest in it almost in, in any story that's out there. There's a quest. Now, the quest can be epic, right? The quest can be you're going to slay the dragon, but the quest can also be you're going down to the corner market to you know get some groceries because you know your your partner asked you to and there are five steps in every quest the first is you need a quester or questers right so either one or more people who have a place to go and that place can be real right it can be to the laundromat it can be imagined so it can be you know midgar uh, it can be physical so you want to get to the point in which you can run a marathon, or it can be emotional, right? You need to get past, you know, some emotional trauma, or you need to become a happy person, right? So these are places that the quester ne needs to go. And stated reasons for going there, you know, I need to go to the laundromat because I have laundry to do. I need to go to Midgar because I have a, you know, I have a ring to dispose of. I need to uh, run a marathon because my doctor says I'm out of shape, and I need to get past this this traumatic event because my life has been is is stagnant. In challenges and trials along the way, the person that goes to the store and comes back with nothing happening whatsoever is not a story, right? We don't tell our friends stories like that. Like I went to the grocery store got groceries and came home. That's not a story, that's just an event. Uh, you know, a story is I went to the grocery store, there was a stick up, I had to wrestle with the person, blah, blah, blah. That becomes a quest. So there have to be challenges and trials along the way. And once it's all over, the real reason to go there, what was it really about? And that's usually really about self-knowledge, about learning about oneself or better understanding oneself. And it's, in, I should be clarified, not all quests are successful. There are quests that aren't successful. The person sets out to do something and fails. You could say The Great Gatsby is about a failed quest, right? Somebody, you know, the Jay Gatsby sets out to become rich and to win his love, and he dies. Oops, spoiler alert. Um, so, you know, when we look at any story, if we can frame it as a quest, we start to get more understanding and sometimes there's more than one quest going on you have characters who are whose quests are intersecting especially when you get into stories with several different characters so one question we like to ask within literature is is that a symbol and often the answer is yes but how do you figure that out so the answer is yes but what kind of symbol is it and this is important to understand is that the symbols don't necessarily have fixed meanings. They change with time. A good example is the hand gesture, or they change with time, they change with culture. So a good example is the hand gesture for the peace sign. In the United States, it's holding up two fingers outward. That's supposed to mean peace. In other cultures, that's the equivalent of what we would do when we don't like somebody, which is give them the finger. So we have to understand that Meanings aren't necessarily fixed, and so we're continually trying to figure out what symbols are. The only time meanings are fixed are when you're dealing with allegory. So when we read Young Goodman Brown, some would argue that Young Goodman Brown is more allegory than it is, um, it, it is more, it is much more allegorical as a story than it is a story, or th than it is symbolic, right? Because you have characters whose names often represent who they are. Uh, typically in, uh, in in fairy tales or, or in fables, you often see allegory at play. Actions and objects are fair game. And I think this is something not everybody understands, is that it's not just objects that are symbols. Actions are symbols. If you've ever watched the original Star Wars trilogy, 
there's symbolism in when Darth Vader slices off Luke Skywalker's hand, and then in the following Return of the Jedi, Luke Skywalker slices off Darth Vader's hand. It tells you, that symbolic action tells you who's in charge, who's powerful, who has command over themselves and others. So you want to be on the lookout for action as well. It's not just objects. Connecting the dots, with symbolism, you're really trying to connect the dots. of trying to understand, you know, how this symbol connects to the story as a whole, how this symbol connects to the people involved, and also where else does this symbol show up. Um, sometimes the symbol is going to be just contained within the story, but more often you can connect that symbol with some larger uh, symbolic system. So, and, and it is a guessing game. You're gonna, you're gonna try to guess, or you're gonna try to figure out lots of these, and you're gonna be wrong a lot of times, but that's okay. The idea is that you try, and you keep looking for them, because if you're not looking for them, you're certainly not gonna see any. And you also want to think about what, you know, one question to ask is what feelings are triggered. Uh, this does open up some interesting ideas, is that you don't just go with what you can interpret, but you also think about how things trigger feel or how things um, move you and wonder about the symbolism behind that, right? I, and if you want a good example, again, the American flag is a great example. That triggers different feelings for people. Uh, depending on where they sit within the culture, where they sit with their beliefs, um, that can trigger different feelings. A dove triggers different feelings. A, a cross, right, the Christian cross, that's a symbol, and that triggers different feelings for people. So being aware of something that can trigger feelings might be a symbol. So when you sit down and you're reading a text, um, Foster likes to say, don't read with your eyes. And what he means by that is you want to immerse yourself in the reading. You don't just want to sit there at a distance, but you want to kind of get into that world. You want to understand and see the world from the character's views. You want to see the world from the writer's views. You don't want to just sit from afar. You want to realize and accept that it's not your own world. You'll read things that you are very much not liking, either because you don't find it as engaging, or because it represents a world you, uh, a world view, or an understanding or exploration of worlds that you do not like, or do not approve of. Right? A lot of the stories we read, you know, there's it, it's clearly a male dominant society, and many of us would refuse that world or reject that world. Don't reject the world. I mean, you can on a personal level, but when you're reading it. Step aside from that. Step outside of that and try to understand and accept this is the way this fictional world is. You don't have to love it, but you do want to get into it. It cannot be, you know, it does not have to be your world, but it is a world that, that has been created, and to understand it better, you kind of have to accept it. You just don't have to agree with it. And so it just kind of understanding that and, and knowing that and, and moving past that is, is really useful. Alright, so a word about irony. Um, a lot of authors do play around with this. We see irony increasingly up through modern culture. Um, but a couple things to be aware of. You know, in the end, as, as Foster says, irony trumps everything. That is, there are all these standard rules for, or, or all these expectations around fiction. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, an author might use irony as a way of flouting them. So we, of course, have verbal irony. And this is the intention of saying one thing and meeting another. Um, people sometimes think of this as sarcasm as well, uh, but it's not, it doesn't always have to be sarcasm, right? Sarcasm, sarcasm can't, th there's overlap here, but sarcasm is often, you know, an intentional, it's intentional in the idea of trying to be mocking, whereas intentional in terms of verbal irony isn't always meant to be mocking. It, it can be just having, being confused or, or not fully understanding what you're saying. There's dramatic irony, um, and this is when the audience, the reader, knows something that the character doesn't, right? So foreshadowing is, is the biggest example of a dramatic irony. 
you know, an author drops a hint that things are going to go bad. Another good example of dramatic irony is um, if you've ever been, if you've ever watched the, you know, any kind of horror movie, there's usually a point within the horror movie where, you know, the crazy killer person is in the room behind the door and the protagonist is walking in the room. You know the person, you know the, the villain is in the room and you're saying, don't go in the room, don't go in the room. That's dramatic irony. That's you fighting or, or wanting to try to save the person because you know what's in that room where that person doesn't. And then there's situational irony. And this is very much kind of the anticipated situation as contrast to the actual occurrence. So the best example of this is the story of the Gift of the Magi by O. Henry. And basically at the end of the story, these two lovers who profoundly care for one another buy an important... Uh, th they're very poor, but they buy a, a precious gift for one another. So the man buys this, um, this hairpin for his wife who has beautiful hair. And the wife buys this nice chain because the man has this great pocket watch. Well, what ends up happening is, in order for the man to buy the the hair pe uh, to to buy the hairpin, he has to sell his pocket watch. In order for the women the woman to buy the gold chain, she has to cut and sell her hair. And so there's this great irony that occurs, the situational irony of they got wonderful gifts from one another, but neither of them can now enjoy it. So you see the anticipated situation, making their partners happy, contrasted with the actual occurrence. They can't use those gifts. All right, so we have the law of intentionality, or why we love our sick, twisted, demented, and depraved authors. And this is pretty much just keeping in mind that everything in a fictional work is intentional. So therefore, all deaths are murders. And who does the murdering? The author. The author intentionally kills every one of the people in the book. Nobody just accidentally dies. The author kills them with some intention and meaning. All weather is controlled, right? So there are no unexpected storms, per se. The author has created that storm for purpose. All fights are decided, so regardless of who gets into a fight and who wins, the author had already decided that. And so you're continually asking yourself, why this, why that? What is the author intending? Because nobody accidentally died. No fight was, you know, undecided. All loves are set to succeed or fail. So again, you know, if the lovers succeed, you know, why did the author intend that as opposed to the author that failed? These didn't just happen by circumstance. They were co they were orchestrated by the author. So that is, nothing happens by accident. Things falling out of the sky, things blowing up, there, you know, things catching fire. None of that is accidental. The author intends it. And yeah, I have that little note down there. You know, the world all in this case means almost all. Like most absolute statements, they. The second they are uttered, they cease being absolute. So I say all of this, but of course, fiction does what it wants. All right, the law of unintentional influence, or when an author is channeling culture. Um, we, as products of our culture, are continually channeling our culture. And so it's important, and we're not always aware of the impacts and the ways in which it shapes our views. The best example of this is, of course, around gender and the ways in which we we communicate or, or we channel views about gender without ever knowing it. If you want the best example of that, very easy. Whenever you encounter somebody who is pregnant, what's the one question? You, is pregnant or just had a baby? What's the one question you want to ask them? Is it a boy or a girl? Right? So you're channeling gender right now, right, right in that question whether you're aware of it or not. You're asking them, you're not asking the health of the baby, you're not asking anything, but you're immediately saying, please let me know if I can view it as a boy or as a girl. Experiencing the stress of the world in a nice neat package. So we're ch constantly channeling culture, whether we're aware, aware of it or not. And we will often, or writers often, are channeling that stress into what they're writing, uh, channeling that culture into what they're writing, and it does make for a nice, neat package. There's lots of works that you can look at from a cultural perspective that make sense, that, oh, yeah, well, if we understand what's going on in the culture, why this work was written then makes total sense. 
and I kind of joke around, what you see is not what you fret. This is particularly with horror, that whenever you're looking at anything horrible, you know, whenever you're looking at horror, or whenever you're looking at dark works, you know, what we're afraid of on the screen isn't necessarily what is the real monster behind um, the culture. So down the bottom we have three really good examples. The first is Godzilla, and kind of just very briefly, the 1950s, we saw a lot of horror films around giant, um, giant monsters that could ravage city and shoot heat rays out of their mouth and stuff. And when we talk about channeling culture, well, if we look at the 1950s, it's the decade after the nuclear, the, the development of the nuclear war, uh, I'm sorry, the nuclear bomb, and we also have the Cold War starting up. So this idea of some large thing coming in and ravaging cities, just utterly destroying them, starts to make a certain amount of sense. And the middle picture there, we have a picture of Jason Voorhees and, and Freddy Krueger, um, slasher films of the 1980s, which usually pitted male slashers, right, male, these male monsters after female leads, is in some ways a response to the feminist movement in this attempt to try to, it was a backlash, you know, color, uh, after almost 20 years of the feminist movement, the ways in which women were achieving or trying to achieve independence, um, there was a very strong conservative backlash to that and this, this, this fear of women or this attempt to put women back in their place. Um, or this challenge around women challenging the, the male authority, which in the horror flicks was, of course, the, you know, the, the slasher, the person who wielded the power, who, we, you know, who, who struck fear in the hearts of others. Um, and then the last one on the right is an alien, and if you look at the 1990s and the rise of alien films that we see during that period, a lot of them have to do with um, aliens coming to Earth and how we deal with that, or, or them coming to Earth and wreaking havoc on the world, right? You have Independence Day, you have Mars Attack, you have Alien Nation, you have another few films in the Alien series, um, and this is going on at the same time that immigration is ramping up and that there's immigration legislation going on in California that will have, you know, long-term consequences. And of course, California is where many of these movies are being made. So those are just some examples of, of the unintentional influence. Nobody sat down and said, I'm going to make a monster movie that's representative of, you know, nuclear bombs or... I'm going to make a slasher film that's, you know, engaging in, in the issues of feminist politics, or I'm going to make an alien movie that's, you know, about immigration. Th they didn't necessarily consciously do this, but these are the things that were channeled through their experiences, through the creator's experiences. All right, so that's this mini lecture. I hope you got some really good tools. Um, there, there's a lot more that we'll cover here in fiction, but I hope this is a good start. Thank you for listening. See you in the next video.